Do you want to start a thriving real estate career, but don't know where and how to start? Do you want to become a successful realtor or investor, but lack the required knowledge and skills? Gear yourself up with the best and actionable advice here on The Real Estate Rundown. Tune in as Shannon Robnett talks with industry veterans about all kinds of asset classes, market trends, challenges, management techniques, and success stories. Listen to informative discussions with valuable tips that will serve as the foundation for your incredible real estate venture. Now, here's your host, Shannon Robnett. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to season two of the Real Estate Rundown Show. Today, I have the huge pleasure of talking with a friend of mine, a guy that I've gotten to know kind of in and around things. You know, we live, we, we live kind of close together. We work kind of in the same markets. Uh, we both are dashingly handsome, as you can tell. But uh, my friend Gary Lipsky is with me. And uh, Gary, I want to welcome you to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, uh, it was great getting to know you the last uh, few months. Yeah, you know, the thing that I that I see is, you know, you've done, what, a quarter billion dollars? I think that's what we were talking about, a quarter billion dollars in real estate. You're no spring chicken to this game, and yet we're, we're seeing turmoil in the market again. Um, but, you know, tell me, take me back through your whole experience here so we can kind of get some context of, of how you're going to be approaching the next couple of years or the next couple of months. But tell us a little bit about where, where you came from and, and, and what you're doing and what your, what your superpower is, really. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Uh, I've navigated tough wars through 2008. I wasn't in real estate full-time at that point. I was just kind of dabbling um, with it, but I owned a business at the time um, and, you know, dealt with, you know, lender cutting off your credit line and, you know, didn't know if we were going to survive that, you know, that business and, and, you know, making, you know, managing your cash flow and managing your, your team and, and, and navigating through that is, is not easy, but, you know, we you build those systems. You you you. We've, I've been through you know trials and tribulations, and that is really important when you get to a period like this to um, to know how how you're going to navigate those waters and and how you got to keep you know checking your systems. Uh, you know, doing your um, evaluating your properties and making sure they're all stress tested and managing your cash flow and being very, very proactive so that you're not hit, you know, and, and, you know, oops, I don't have any more cash flow to pay the bills. Like that should never, ever happen. Right. Like you should right. always be ahead of the game. So, right. so, you uh, know, but, I, but Gary, what, what I'm hearing you say is it's experience that has taught you that, right. That's not something you can get off the shelf. Right. I mean, it's kind of like when you go into battle, you've got the experienced people telling everybody else what to do and the less experience you have, the less authority you get, you're just kind of out there. But but we're seeing that same thing as I've never seen this before. When people are saying that, it scares the heck out of me for the rest of everybody because we've got people like that. And there was a lot of people like that in 05 and 06 and 07 that helped us make 08, right? So at the end of the day, when I get to the, 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 the conversations with people like yourselves that have actually executed. They've done the, the hard work, whether it's in real estate. I, I would argue that, that business is harder than real estate because real estate kind of, in a lot of ways, manages itself. When you look at it, you've got you know 300 units in an apartment complex. You don't have 300 employees like you would in a business. But, but what, is your, what, are, what are you really looking at over the next 12 months? And what business skill did you learn in your previous life and now that you're going to be able to deploy as the Swiss army knife of, no, no, no worries, man. I got this. Yeah. You know, I, you know, it's all about um, how you approach things because there's opportunity in every, in, in an up market and a down market. Um, but it's managing risk. And so what you have to do is you have to be, you know, we've always been very conservative in our underwriting, but build in the SOFA model into your underwriting and, and have buffers along the way. I mean, this is, same th way we've been underwriting for for years and, and approaching things. Um, you never want to do a deal if it's razor thin. It's just not worth it. Right. Um, you always want to uh, under promise and overperform. So 
you and nothing goes perfect and 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 no having that mindset that nothing will go perfect really sets you up for wait a minute things. are you admitting to everybody that none of your deals have gone perfectly heck yeah that's true <laughs> you're not supposed to let the secret out about what gp really means right i thought that meant go perfect that's not what that means we had a deal that was <laughs> absurdly phenomenal to our investors and man that was that was probably our hardest deal we dealt with from before we we bought it to running it to to selling it. I mean, we faced many many obstacles, but it's it's pushing forward and problem solving and working with your team and being proactive and that's how you that's how you get a good deal to be great or a bad deal to be good. Right. And you know that's the thing that I think a lot of people and we I saw it in 08, right? I saw people just kind of throw up their hands and go, "I have no idea how to solve this. Here it's yours," right? I was touring with a lender uh, three months ago, and they were already seeing stuff in Houston where the, where the uh, banks were getting keys back, right? I mean, three months ago it wasn't near as bad as it is now, and you're looking at it going, "What was the problem there?" Well. I think it was exactly what you're talking about. It was that lack of tried and true through the fire leadership. And I think you're going to continue to see a lot of that uh, where investors are going to realize that the, that the GP, the people that they partnered with in this syndication um, needed a lot more experience in real world entrepreneur, getting your head caved in, getting back up tomorrow and going back to work for some unknown reason other than I just can't let this end this way. Yeah, unfortunately, I think there's going to be some some shakeout in the next 12, 24 months, and and of of GPs giving the good you know bad GPs giving good GPs a bad name because they just focus on churning deals, churning deals, and not managing interest rate, floating. Uh, cash flow, all, all these things that when when things don't go perfect, you're gonna you're gonna pay a price, and it's it adds up quickly. Yeah, you know, and I've I've seen that uh, I've seen underwriting come across my desk in the last you know 120 days from other people going, hey, would you take a look at this for me? And I'm sitting there going, why would you even consider a four and a half percent exit cap rate? Right? Why? Why? Well, we're buying it at less than that. I'm not talking about how stupid you are going in. I'm talking about how how long do you think that this market's going to stay for you going out, you know? And and when you start to look at that and you start to, you know, and, and we're seeing a lot of that, what you just talked about, people exiting uh, a five-year deal in in 18 months because the, because the uh, NOI looks great from a percentage number. But if you look at the uh, deliverable on what the real ROI is, it's not a 2x like they talked about, right? They talked about, give me your money for five years, invest with me for five years, and you're getting a 2x. We're seeing a lot of these people flip out of deals and go, dude, we got you a 50%, but the NOI is a 1.3x, right? Or not the NOI, sorry, the ROI is a 1.3x, right? And so you're seeing that where they look great on paper, but just like you said, Gary, they don't understand the fundamentals enough to realize that you just gave up a great deal. Yes, you did. You did give a guy $30,000 back on his money, but what are you buying in the next 12 or 18 months where you could have continued to grow his capital, which is really what he trusted you to do? Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. So, so now that we've just, we've established that there's going to be blood, uh, and, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, all through our careers, whether it was, you know, in real estate or not, we've had catastrophes. We had, you know, 9-11, uh, we had the Gulf War, we had, you know, we had uh, 2008, we had, uh, you know, Cerveza sickness. We had all these different things that have, that have come along that have been challenges, but that's what entrepreneur, I think it means, it's like an Indian word for really stupid. Uh, that we've translated to tenacious or something like that as far as entrepreneur. But when you really look at this, Gary, what do you see the next 12 months look like for your business? And how are you going to uniquely position to, to take advantage of the next 12 months? 
So I, I'm always glass half full. So I'm looking at it as opportunity. You know, I'm seeing debt that is going to cost me about 2% more, but I'm seeing deals 20, 25% off, not all deals, but some deals uh, that are sent to me off market. So for me, that that's opportunity. I'm willing to, I'm, I'll gladly take that discount now. And when I go to sell it, when the market is better down the road, Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to not only force appreciation, but take advantage of, of pricing going going back up. Um, there's a lot of pricing discovery right now. Um, maybe there's going to be some some people that are going to be forced to sell to get out of you know a floating rate deal that's expiring, or they can't meet the um, the loan uh, covenants. So there's opportunity, but obviously we're not going to be aggressive we're going to be conservative in our underwriting wait for the right deal we're not forced to do a deal just to do a deal just to cover my overhead you know i'd rather sit on the sidelines for a year year and a half which i've done before waiting for the right deal um so you know we're gonna we're gonna keep keep underwriting keep evaluating the deals talking to brokers and when there's an opportunity we like we're gonna we're gonna seize upon it you know, and I think that's what a lot of people, um, you know, that's where the FOMO has kicked in. And the next thing coming is a casket because really you had to get in there. You had to do it. You had to do it. Well, now you've done it, right? And you've done it on a, such a colossal scale. It's not like you bought a single family home that you can stomach on your own. You've got, you've got huge, huge responsibility when you're talking 20, 30, $40 million deals. And when you're looking at those and you're going, I, I got to get through this. My underwriting is, you know, of the opinion and the mindset that I have to have, provide this protection. I, I think that that sends a huge message to your tribe, to your people, to, to the people that you're working with that, you know, this is why I like Gary, because he's not just running down the street going, oh my God, it's for sale. We have to have it. Right. Or, oh my gosh, it's 20% off. Well, 20% off of 30% overpriced is still not a deal. Right. Right. So 20% off of where it should be and 2% better or worse pricing on your debt means that we're going to be about the same NOI as the higher price and the lower debt. But now this is a good deal and it works and we can take advantage because yes, at the end of the day, like you're saying, we cash back out to real dollars, right? When we get all done, we're cashing back out to real dollars. So if we can catch that price decline now, hold it till the surge comes up and the pricing goes back up and then cash out at that point, you're just watching the ebb and flow of the tide. And we're seeing we're, there's always been great opportunity with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, well, another thing that we do is we don't chase deals all over the country. We want to be experts in a few markets, right. Other brokers, we have all, you know, thousands of data points. So, you know, we're, we're making very informed decisions. If, if it's in another market, I don't know what's going on in that market. You know, I can read all the data, but I, I really need to study market for a period of time for me to, for me to be able to really know that market. You know, and I think that that's important because people have chased all over. And then you look at, you know, you got to deal in, I know like Tucson's one of your markets, right? You got to deal in Tucson, then you got another deal in North Carolina, then you got another deal in Pittsburgh. How in the heck do you have any comparisons with that? Whereas if you focus on it, like you do, like I do, right? I'm in, I'm in two markets, right? And, and I'm very close to both of those markets and I know those markets very well. So at the end of the day, I can make sure that these things happen in those markets and I'm good, right? Yeah. So when I see what's happening and, and you're, you're, you're reacting to your intimate knowledge in the market, um, how are you seeing that as um, uh, adding more value to your investors, to you? Is it because you can dial in tighter and you're really familiar with it and you really know? Or is it that uh, you, you, you've become a major player or are you getting some discounts on your management? What is it really that happens and why do you, to, to be so profitable, to be laser focused? So a deal we're going to close next week, uh, a broker called me. Um, he sold me a deal two blocks down the street. So he, he ran over some numbers on the phone. Immediately, I was interested because it just made, it made sense. It was a discount from that property that I bought. Um, 
it was a lot more land. Uh, it was just a nicer property. Certainly we underwrote it and then I toured it. And, and this was a deal I didn't have to, I didn't have to battle anyone else for strictly right. off market discounted. I know the mar I know I'm getting $450 rent bumps two blocks down the street. So I know I can get it here. Um, I could probably get more because the rents are lower and I, I and there's more, uh, more of a blank canvas I can work with to add more amenities and stuff like that. So just something like that, we can, we can jump on right away because of that, because of the relationships and because of the, the market uh, experience. You know, and, and you, you did something I just did too. Uh, you know, so I'm assuming that that broker is your broker on this deal on both sides, right? Yep. So the guy, the guy already closed the deal with you. He knows you can get it done, right? He knows that that's not going to be an issue for you. Then he knows that if he brings you the deal, he's going to get both sides, right? So he's looking out for himself, but that works really well. And you have that relationship that you talked about. So he goes, dude, I can make two phone calls and have this deal done, or I can put it on the market and deal with 90 people asking 10 questions, or I can deal with Gary asking the same 10 questions. I can, I can make my life simple and I can make twice as much, right? That's intelligence, but it also, in, in that broker's defense, he did exactly what the owner said, get rid of the property, right? And so I think you're going to see definitely now, you know, because you and I didn't know what this whisper thing was three years ago, right? What's this whisper? Well, the whisper is where we think you should write your contract and then go from there, right? But these, these are the ways that things happened in multifamily before, and it was that relationship, right? And it was that intimate knowledge where you can, on the phone, you know 90% of the questions to ask, you know 80% of the problems you're going to run into, and now all you need is to physically put it to paper and walk the property to fill in answering the questions. I bet, honestly, even though you probably wrote your contract with 15, 20, 30 days of due diligence, I bet within 72 hours, your complete due diligence package was answered. Am I wrong? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we knew from our <laughs> right. underwriting without even looking at it. I go on Google, Google Maps, go on the property. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to throw in, you know, a few hundred for reserves, you know, based yeah. on, you know, how we typically underwrite. And I mean, we were right, right on, you know, a couple of, couple of tweaks, but yeah, we, yeah. Exactly. And that's the value, right? Instead of trying to underwrite in Charlotte and learn that market and spending time there and then go to Texas and do that one and then, you know, be focused. And I think that that, that is a huge benefit and has served you well, right? Now, that, how, how, long have you, how long have you been looking from the time that got brought to you to the time you closed? How long, how long a window was that? Um, oh, the, I mean... We underwrote it like that day. I, I probably flew out there two days later. I don't I don't mess around. Like when there's right. an offer out there that I liked, I'm like, I don't want someone else moving in in front of me. Right. Like we jumped on it immediately. So six weeks, eight weeks. What, what oh. was your? Oh, by the time we we signed a contract, there was probably like a week. I I, I don't. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to be closed and done in less than forty five days. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Um, it, you know, it, it's. It's funny. It'll be it'll be about sixty days because right. the seller was um, he, the he's buying another property. So we were waiting right. on him, right, for his to get him the the contract on the other deal where right. our contract was done within days. Yeah. It took him like three weeks on the other side. So we were moving forward, doing yeah. everything we needed to do, knowing that he was going to get it all worked out, and we were we were set to go. Well, the other side of that is you know, the broker has got the least amount of work applied to a 60 day period. And now he knows there's two for Gary, zero for the other guys. He's, you know, you're building that relationship with this broker that he's going to now go, um, Gary, can you do another one? Right. Yeah. He's going to go back to his network. He's now going to become your guy. And if you're trying to spread that over five or eight or 12 markets, you're not getting anybody's attention unless you're writing a billion dollars worth of deals a year. And, you know, there's some people that can do that. Um, that's not most shops. So let's, let's turn this around. I want to ask you a couple of very specific questions and feel free to tell me you're not going to answer that. However, I want to ask you, what has been your biggest acquisition so far? 
we did a $59 million deal um, a few months ago, uh, 248 units in, in Tucson, uh, B plus property um, that's doing, we're like 98% occupied. We keep raising rents. It's been doing phenomenal. Awesome. And, and then uh, what is your largest or what is your most successful exit so far? Yeah, we sold one six weeks ago. That was over 3X in under 20 months. Yeah. Um, we, it was just perfect timing. Tucson as well. See what I'm yeah. saying? See, what I'm, see yeah. what I'm saying, boys and girls? He's staying in the same market because he knows what's happening, right? That's, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. So what was the secret sauce of that? I mean, obviously, I think that one surprised you because I don't think you underwrote to a 3X. Right. Yeah, no way. What was, what uh, was the know, secret sauce? Uh, really good asset management, finding a solution where others didn't, because this was, we assumed their loan, um, and we we basically were like the last man standing when we when we bought this in December 2019. Um, other people have fallen out. They didn't want to assume the loan. We said, yeah, we'll assume the loan. Give us a million dollars off. And so that, that was, that was great. We got a great price point and, and there was a lot of challenges along the way. It was definitely a, a bit rougher than we thought there were, you know, guns, drugs. We had some, a lot of COVID. Staff turnover, I mean, don't but, forget but that, the market right? was fantastic. You know, yeah. we kept raising rents and the market was fantastic. We, we improved the, the resident experience. We put a lot of money into CapEx and, and timed it, timed it right. We, we, it would have been actually even more if we, if we sold it like 60 days earlier, um, sure. we, we got into a little bit of the stormy weather, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is a, a unicorn deal, you know? Yeah. Well, you know what though? I mean, look, you can't get lucky like that if you're not taking swings, right? If you're not, if you're not out there doing the deals, you're not going to have those. But the reality is, you're going to get those because of great underwriting. You're going to get those because you're able to solve the seller's problem. You know, I mean, like you said, the seller had a specific thing. I want you to assume my loan. What I'm, what I'm reading into that is that there was a heavy prepayment penalty, right? Yeah, yeah. So you solved their problem. You took away a little bit of their profit, but you solved their problem and it was better off for them. You now had loan in place. Everything was working. Then you dealt with, you know, uh, the guns and the drugs. I'm, I'm, you know, I think you have a different definition of drug testing than I have. I mean, you know, you guys were probably anyway. No, uh, but the funny thing is, is you can't get lucky, like everybody says. Well, that was a unicorn deal, Gary. Good for you. Well, you couldn't have done that if you hadn't solved the problem in the beginning, right? And that comes from, back from everything we've been talking about in this episode of experience as an entrepreneur, right? Solving the problem is really what this journey is all about. And if you can't do that, there's no point in continuing to attempt this, this multifamily or small business or whatever it is, because really at the end of the day, you're making money by solving people's problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. You got to be creative. You got to be proactive and um, you got to keep standing up every day. You get knocked down. So, right. So let's switch gears. I want to go a different direction. I want to ask you a couple of questions. What is something incredibly cool that most people don't know about you that you can huh. tell us in this interview? All right. Well, uh, uh, it's in my bio, but I don't think a lot of people know. I actually co-produced a few low-budget independent films in my 20s. Like Swamp Thing, Thing from Mars? What, what, what? <laughs> um, what? You probably never heard of them. One, one was called Goose with Jennifer Tilly, Joan Rivers, Robert Klein. So some, some well-known names. I wouldn't call that. I mean, maybe low budget because you didn't have much money, but you had some big names. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What uh, was that? Was that your business before? Is the movies? Um, well, that that was. I've I've had a number of different businesses. I've had a number of different lives. In in college, I owned a restaurant delivery service. We started during uh, the break, that, like a DoorDash and whatnot. Um, and then I, I started getting involved in, in film work and did that. And then, uh, coincidentally, I was running a script with a buddy of mine who had a music education company and I was having a child at the time. And so he introduced me to a school and we started, 
they said I needed some sports programs. So I said, I'll, I'll get you some sports programs. You know, I needed to keep that cash flow coming in. So I started doing that and, and grew that business to over uh, 700 employees, 700 independent contractors. We are working with 9,000 students on a daily basis throughout Southern California, wow. doing after school programs, outdoor edge, leadership development, um, and sold that at the end of 2016 uh, to get into real estate full time. I had been investing, but I didn't want to have one foot in 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 on one business, one foot on the other. I wanted to really commit and learn and excel in real estate. So I sold that other business um, and and have been cranking on real estate ever since. You know, it's funny too because really a lot of what we do as syndicators and where a lot of that came from was from the film business, uh, from the film industry. In fact, that's, and it's funny, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because one of the people that taught me how to syndicate came out of the film, build, film business. He was a fundraiser in Hollywood for other films. And that's where I learned most of my syndication. Is that where you kind of learned how to raise capital or was that just purely from production, co-producing part of it? You, you know, it's a little bit, of it, being creative and solving problems, you've got to make the day, you know? So you've got, You've got to film, let's say, 10 pages in this day, no matter what. And we've got to make the day in, 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 in uh, real estate. We've got to figure out, problem, right. solve, problem solve. You know, there's no, there's no crying in real estate. Figure it out. Let's move on. You know, working with, with different people. And, and that was the, the biggest skill set I learned, that, that creative yeah. problem solving, getting it done, no matter what. Well, and I think that's probably what we should call this episode is, you know, how to find the value in the deals by getting it done, right? Finding what is what is motivating the seller, what is, what is you know, you guys need sports programs. I'm having a kid. I need cash flow, right? I mean, all those things as entrepreneurs, um, I think that's what a lot of people don't quite grasp is that we're not here to to be on a smooth paved road. If you want that, grab a government job, right? We're here for the bumps. We're here for the problem solving. And so Gary, I really appreciate you being candid with this and, and, and letting everybody know that GP does not mean goes perfect and that there are other lives that people have. So um, anything, any closing comments you wanna share with my audience, I'd love to hear. Well, I guess, you know, if, if you're going to invest, make sure you're investing with uh, an operator that is strong in asset management, that has, um, you know, strong entrepreneurial skills. And, you know, it's in, invest with the operator, not necessarily the deal. Yeah, you know, that is very true. And the next 12 to 24 months, like you said, are going to prove that point as to who the operators are who the general partners are that are strong, that understand this, that can get things done and get things across the finish line, come up with solutions where others can't. So guys, I hope you got as much out of this as I do. Gary, I want to say thank you for being with us today. And thank you for tuning into the Real Estate Rundown. Guys, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the Real Estate Rundown wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a review. I'd love to hear from you. I will respond. And if you want to get a hold of us, send me an email at connect at shannonrobnet.com. That's everything for today on the Real Estate Rundown, guys. Thanks for being with us. That's a wrap for today's episode of the Real Estate Rundown. Let these newfound strategies pave the way to start a successful career or a profound rebranding. If you loved everything you have heard, listen to more conversations at www.shannonrobnet.com. And be sure to leave a rating, share it with your friends, and subscribe. Until the next episode. Amen.